We're into week series, uh, week two of our series entitled Be Brave. We're talking about bravery. And last week, Pastor Joel introduced our series and spoke to us about brave obedience. This week, we continue the series and we'll speak about brave witness. Brave witness. Bravery is a character trait that most of us admire, right? We admire bravery. We think that it's a virtuous character trait. It's something that we admire in others and hopefully something that we experience in our own lives. Maybe it's a character trait that you, you hope others will observe in your life. If someone looks at you, you hope that they think that you are, you are a brave person. Witnessing. Witnessing, the second part of this morning's message, brave witness. Witnessing, by that I mean sharing our faith, the good news of Christ saving us, the gospel message, witness. Being brave in our witness. For some of us, many of us, I would say, witness is something that we might find a little bit intimidating. Taking that moment to share your faith. And if you're anything like me, sometimes witness can be intimidating. Not sure what it is. But there's that moment, and if you've experienced this moment, you know exactly what I'm talking about, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to share your faith, and for whatever reason, you get that kind of you know butterfly feeling, that little flutter in your heart. Any, anybody ever get that when, when it comes time to witness? I don't know why that is. You can talk about anything in the world without a moment's hesitation, but when it comes to that moment to witness, sometimes we get a little bit nervous. So being brave in our witness is, is sometimes a challenge. Am I right, church? Am I the only one here? It's a challenge. It can be a little bit intimidating. But church, God is calling us to be brave in our witness, to be bold, to share our faith boldly. I'm reminded of a a story about my brother, and I'll brag on my family a little bit here. My older brother, he's a couple years older than me, and several years ago, when he was in his early years in law school, my brother participated in one of the evangelistic initiatives of one of the campus ministries. Uh, my my brother and I, we went to the University of Western Ontario. When I say that in London, Ontario, where I'm from, everyone says that's a fantastic school. When I say that in the GTA, everyone says that's a party school. I wouldn't know. I never participated in that. Honestly, uh, it was a fantastic school for the record. University can be those years for, for our young people, for our young adults. Post-secondary years can be some of the most challenging years. Those are the years when, as young people, you begin to find your identity, who you are. You express your voice. It's also during those years when, quite often, our post-secondary students can undergo a philosophical challenge to their entire value system. And for many people in post-secondary institutions, the peer pressure, the social pressure can be immense. It can be so strong that the tendency, the temptation might be to duck and cover and say, okay, during these post-secondary years, I'm just going to mind my own business. I'm just going to stay focused. Uh, I'll do my best to go to church on Sunday, but through the week, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, mind my own business, and get through this. And when university is done, then I'll come up, I'll, I'll emerge, and I'll be an outspoken Christian again. And I'm not trying to make light of that, okay? I know that the pressures are strong, but that's a very real thing that our post-secondary students face. Uh, And I so admire my older brother. I didn't tell him that I was going to say this this morning, so hopefully he's okay with this. Uh, But I so admire my older brother because during his post-secondary years, especially during his law school years, he didn't do that at all. And there was an evangelistic initiative that took place where the entire university was invited. They used to, the, the campus ministry that he was working with, that he was volunteering for, they used to do this initiative where they would draw on students uh, they would invite students by saying to them that when you attend, you you know your name or your number. They would give them uh, some some kind of uh, a ticket would be drawn from this you know this bucket, this raffle. And if your name was drawn, you would receive free tuition for a year. So we're we're not above bribing people in our witness, right, Church? Uh, so this would this would actually draw on thousands of students. They would advertise this across the campus. They would canvas and plaster this across the campus, and so. Thousands of unchurched students would come into one of the largest lecture halls on the university. And I'll never forget my brother's bravery as in in front of thousands of unchurched students and some professors, my brother gave his testimony. He gave witness for Christ. My brother was really brave. I was in attendance at that event and I was shivering in my boots. 
I wasn't being very brave. My brother was, and I always admired that about my brother. Uh, I use him as an example, but there are countless other examples out there. We are fortunate enough that we live in a country where we are free to share our faith. Church, there are many Christians across this world for whom bravery in witness is more significant than just the social stigma they might face. There are many persecuted Christians across our world for whom sharing their faith requires bravery, not because it's going to cost them social clout, but because it could cost them their lives. There are many Christians across this world uh, who live in countries where freedom of religion is, is not a right, where freedom of speech is not a right, but because they take so seriously the instruction of our Lord to go and make disciples, they bravely open their mouths and witness. Many of them are jailed, tortured, and some are even executed for their faith. That's bravery in witness. As we think about the rights that we experience in Canada, this Canada Day weekend, let's not take for granted that freedom of religion and freedom of speech. What a great opportunity we have to be brave in our witness. But I'm challenged again by those that are so brave, even with the cost that is so great. As we think about this, bravery in witness, I'd like us to turn our attention to a passage of Scripture, to a scriptural example of bravery in witness, and it's found in Acts chapter 27. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to that passage now, Acts chapter 27. Uh, If you have our church app, you can download our church app, Heartland of Church Connected. We have our message notes, our Scripture Talk notes there, which will include the passage. And you can also have a look up on the screen as we read this passage this morning. By way of background, the Apostle Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem and then imprisoned in Caesarea for over two years, leading right up to this chapter. As a Roman citizen, Paul used the right of appeal to Caesar. He wanted to stand trial before Caesar. So the local ruler Festus sent him to Rome in the late fall, around A.D. 59. The sea and wind were very dangerous that time of year, and the crew and passengers got into a lot of trouble. During their voyage, Paul suggested wintering in the port of Fair Havens on the island of Crete, but the ship's commanders refused his suggestion and carried on with drastic results, which we'll see this morning. So let's turn our attention to this passage now. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they, say, they saw their opportunity. They wanted to move to a port that would have been better for wintering. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm. We lost our way there. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, of the God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. The shipwreck. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. 
Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and, some, and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at that time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Would you join me as we turn our hearts once again to the Lord in prayer as we look at this passage? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mission that you are doing in this world. Lord, you could have chosen any way to reach those who are far from you, but you chose us. Lord, you chose your followers, to be your messengers. God, would you give us bravery as we witness? Lord, as we look at this passage, as we look at this example of biblical bravery, we ask that you would help us to apply it to our lives today. God, as we go throughout our week, that we would be able to witness boldly. We give you thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's church said, amen. So as I prepared for this message, I did a few things. I, I read some Bible commentary, so I'll comment on that very quickly. Bible scholars agree that the accuracy in terms of the, the, ge the geography, the weather conditions, and the navigational practice, the accuracy from this passage are such that it had to have been recorded from a real voyage. In fact, the usage of the first person, you'll hear the, the writer say we quite frequently, it implies that Luke, who's the author of Acts, himself was aboard this ship. So that was the first part of my research for this passage. The second part of my research was that I went sailing last night. In fact, our marriage ministry uh, couples went on a, a sailing adventure last night. Anybody was with us last night? We had a great time, didn't we? Uh, we survived the shipwreck, and we were able to come back here this morning. We, uh, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't get into a shipwreck, but. Uh, it was it was a great experience in terms of preparing for this message because uh, I was as a, we were on the ship I was looking at all of the rigging we sailed on the tall ship Kayama uh, which had sails and rigging it, it had an iron hull uh, but the ship that was described in this passage was constructed in the ancient world during a time when ship construction was very very different and in fact even though ships were constructed from wood hulls until probably as recently as uh, 150 years ago, uh, the, the way that they were constructed was such that they, the, the wood wasn't cured. And sorry if I'm going into too much detail. I really nerd out about transportation stuff. My wife can tell you about that. It's all I talk about. Uh, but the, the wood wasn't cured, and it was significant because during the winter on the Mediterranean Sea, the, the hull from the ship wouldn't have held together. So this was a very traumatic experience for all who were on board. Thankfully, it wasn't traumatic for all of the couples that came on the marriage ministry adventure last night. Uh, my wife and I, we should have a map here. My wife and I were very fortunate to be able to honeymoon in Greece. We honeymooned in the uh, island of Rhodes. And one of the things we did there was we went on a short little day trip. We went on a sailing trip. And we went in August. 
And I can say that sailing on the Mediterranean in August is a beautiful experience, wonderful experience, High, highly recommend it. But uh, any later than that can be very risky. And in fact, even though we were sailing in August, the winds were very powerful on the, the boat as we sailed. Lots of people lost their hats. Uh, the wind was blowing, things were going overboard. And so what, what we learned was that in uh, the ancient world, the uh, the crew would have launched this particular passage. This was Paul, uh, Paul's final sailing journey. You can see their route, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they launched their journey in mid-October. It was right after the, the Hebrew festival that was mentioned. It was in late October. And in the ancient world, because of the way the ship was constructed, this time of year was universally regarded as the dangerous season for sailing. It extended from September to early November, very dangerous season for sailing. Very rarely would anyone sail during that time. And after November, all but the most necessary and urgent sailing came to an end until the following spring. So you can see again on this map that they made landfall at Fair Havens in Crete, and they wanted to sail a little bit west to Phoenix to be able to winter in that harbor. But it was while they were sailing to Phoenix that the Northeaster came along and blew them off course and they were lost in the Adriatic, lost to a storm, literally in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, which would have been a terrifying experience at that time. So these high seas would overwhelm the ship and smash the ship's structure because of the way it was constructed, hence the undergirding. You remember in the passage, they passed ropes underneath the hull. Uh, the other danger was that they would have drifted far, of course, to the northern shore of the African continent, uh, which is the southern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. You'll see Cyrene there. And there were dangerous shallow gulfs there uh, that sailors feared. So there were great risks associated with trying to sail the Mediterranean at that time. Now, again, the Apostle Paul tried to warn the ship's officers of the dangers, but they disregarded what the Apostle Paul said. They disregarded it because they were unlikely to listen to this imprisoned spiritual leader uh, who they thought had no seafaring experience. And rather than wintering in that exposed harbor of, of Fair Havens, they attempted their luck, uh, of course, to a disastrous end. So there's a lot to see in this passage. A few points that I want to make as we, as we look at this passage and talk about brave witness. My first point is this, that brave witness is courageous. Verse 22 reads this, But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Now, it's interesting because the ship drifted off course, and the Apostle Paul had warned the ship's officers, this is going to happen, this is very risky. But you'll never notice in this passage the Apostle Paul saying, I told you so. That didn't make it into our translation anyway. The Apostle showed grace in his witness by offering to all of the crew the good news of redemption. This required Paul to be humble, but it also required him to be bold and to be brave. Being brave requires us to keep up our courage, which is easier said than done. And as was the case with Paul and the men aboard the ship, often circumstances can discourage us. So I use this map and I use this example. Imagine yourself being on this ship, okay? You're on a ship that's barely held together. You're never supposed to sail that time of year. You've missed your port of call, and all of a sudden you find yourself drifting in the middle of the Mediterranean. I don't know about you, but I would get a little bit panicked in that situation. I would be a little bit stressed out. Often circumstances can become discouraging. And when circumstances become discouraging, it is all the more important that we keep things in perspective and remind ourselves that God will protect us as we faithfully serve him. It may come at a cost. For instance, in this passage, the ship hands lost the ship and cargo. For us, as we uh, keep our perspective of the circumstance and continue to be bold in our witness, it may cost us some social clout. It may even cost us a promotion. But God says to keep courage, to be bold and to be brave. So what does this have to do with witness? Well, I'll use an example. You've probably heard the oft-quoted phrase, from St. Francis of Assisi, where he said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Have you guys heard that quote before? You may be familiar with that. As a preacher and as someone who speaks a lot, I'll say I probably use words maybe a bit too much. Uh, but the, the example is correct. So in this case, 
the Apostle Paul's witness was more than just what he was saying. It was more than just the words that he spoke. It was his example. The discouraging circumstances did not allow, did not cause Paul to lose heart. He kept up his courage. Church, we all know that we face discouraging circumstances from time to time. It could be anything. It could be a familial struggle, a relationship struggle, a health challenge, a financial challenge. It could be a challenge at work. It could be that there's a, a work a situation at work that becomes so stressful that you're tempted to lose your cool. Church, it's exactly in that moment that you can't lose your cool. It's exactly in that moment when things become stressful that you need to keep courage because your witness is more than your words. Your witness is demonstrated by your behavior. It says in Matthew 26, to let your light so shine before people that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In those stressful moments, be brave, be bold, be courageous, keep perspective. Know that God is with you. Don't despair about that hopeless situation. We must not allow our behavior to discourage others. If our conduct is poor, then our witness will be poor. But if our conduct is good, then our witness will be good. Be courageous. Verses 23 to 24 read this. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Now, again, put ourselves in Paul's position here. He's already been in prison for two years in Caesarea. He's going on a, a sailing trip. It wasn't a cruise by any means. During one of the worst times to sail. And he knows that he has to face trial before Caesar. Now, even for the Apostle Paul, that has to be a discouraging scenario. Am I right? But notwithstanding all of that, Paul, in this, in this state as a prisoner, was a free man in Christ, a free person in Christ, free on the inside, living free from fear in God's presence. And while the crew was toiling at the pumps and the rigging, Paul was wrestling in prayer not only for himself, but also for his shipmates. And God spoke through this angel to reassure Paul, reminding him not to be afraid because everyone aboard would be protected by the Lord. Paul trusted in that confirmation that he had received from the Lord and he witnessed boldly. He was convinced that God had already granted him favor. And this gave Paul great confidence in the midst of danger. He could witness and he could be brave in doing it. It's interesting in this passage, the passage says that God would give him all of those lives. God heard, God heard Paul's prayers and gave him all who sailed with him. Think about this in your own context, church, wherever you work, uh, in your own lives. Whatever challenges you're facing, pray through them, wrestle through them in prayer. You can be brave in your witness when you are prayerful, when you give your situation to the Lord in prayer. As intimidating as circumstances may appear, pray through them. God will give you those that surround you, your work, your, your workmates, your fellow students. These are the people that you're sailing through this storm with. Pray for them, even as you're working alongside of them. Pray for them that God would save them and take them as his own. We can be brave in our witness because of the courage we experience through God's nearness and the assurance we have in Christ. I'll say that again. We can be brave in our witness because of the courage we experience through God's nearness and the assurance we have in Christ. One last point on this brave witness being courageous. Verse 25 says this, So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Sometimes you have to be the representative of faith when those around you don't have the strength to have faith. Here the Apostle Paul was encouraging those men aboard the ship, keep courage. Even when they couldn't believe, the Apostle Paul believed. For a third time, this passage reiterates to keep up courage in the Lord because the Lord would save their lives. The Apostle Paul's words here were a testimony assuring the crew and the passengers that God could be trusted. Paul bravely witnessed and testified. And although the crew had previously dismissed Paul's advice when he said not to sail, this time the soldiers listened. We'll revisit this again in my final point. 
My second point is this. Brave witness is for those who are perishing. Brave witness is for those who are perishing. Verses 31 and 32 read this. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Put yourself in, in Paul's position again. Here you are in this chaotic situation. The wind is howling. The water is coming over the deck. And here are a couple of guys just, you know, fighting for their lives. They want to get onto a lifeboat. Imagine having a wherewithal to be able to notice, okay, there are a couple of guys trying to escape the, the ship over there on this boat. My inclination might be, you know what? Good luck to you guys. Wish you the very best. I had the same idea myself. Let them get on with it. But instead, Paul said, no, 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 you guys. I can, I'm confronting you, okay? Don't take that boat. It won't work out for you. The Holy Spirit gave the apostle the boldness and the bravery to confront these men, even while they were trying to scurry away in order to save their lives. And in so doing, the Holy Spirit used Paul to witness to these men. It's interesting. Paul appealed to the soldier's own sense of self-preservation in his witness. What did he say? You cannot be saved that way. And urged them to remain aboard. Friends, whether or not they express it, the people around us who are not in Christ are aware of their own immortality. We see it all the time. Uh, they want to live for today. They want to live in the moment. They want to experience the good life now. Why? Well, because tomorrow is uncertain. And the next day after that is uncertain. And for those who are not in Christ, when, when they die, eternity is uncertain. And they are aware of their own immortality, whether or not they say it. We need to be brave in our witness and remind them they can have eternal life in Christ. Jesus himself that it is, uh, said this, that it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. People are sick and dying, literally and figuratively. Hell is real. And unless people know Christ, they cannot know eternity with him. They cannot enter God's kingdom. They are sick and perishing, and we have the cure. Think about that. As we gather this morning to worship, and I really want to challenge us on this church, increasingly in Canada, those who identify as being born again, we are increasingly a minority in this country. And yet we know the truth. And there is a majority of our country outside the walls of this church, in this case, and outside the walls of this cineplex, who are far from Christ, who are perishing who are destined for an eternity apart from God, and you know the way to keep them from going there. So why do we keep it to ourselves? They're trying to get off on a lifeboat that's not going to save them, and we're watching them do it. Yet we have the ability to say, guys, that's not going to save you. That false truth that you're pursuing is not going to save you. That substance that you're trying to fill the void in your heart with is not going to save you only by following God's way Will you be saved? We know that answer. We know that truth. So why do we keep it to ourselves? It's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. Why do we worry so much about ourselves and our own well-being and our own social standing rather than making an effort and a sacrifice to reach others and to be brave witnesses? It's interesting. Throughout this account, there's a nice balance between God's assurance of safety. Okay, God continues to assure Paul and through Paul, the crew, that they will be safe, but also the people's efforts to ensure it, right? They throw the, the ropes under the hull. Paul was running around the deck, making sure people weren't jumping overboard. Only God can save us. We can't save other people. Only God can save us. We, they can't save themselves. Only God can do that. Yet throughout that, there's also the reality that we need to be vocal. We need to be brave in our witness. It's just like I said when we prayed, that God has chosen us, his followers, to be his witnesses. He could have done it any way he wanted to, but he chose his church to be his mouthpieces to share the good news. God saves them, but he asks you to be his witness. And I encourage you, church, to witness bravely. I'm reminded of another shipwreck story of a different kind. I want to tell you about someone named Lieutenant Reverend Thomas M. Conway. 
And I can say lieutenant because he served in the United States Navy. If we were talking about a Canadian or British military person, I would say lieutenant. So just full disclosure, uh, his, his title was Lieutenant Reverend Thomas M. Conway. And Reverend Conway was a 37-year-old United States Navy chaplain from Buffalo, New York. And he was on board the USS Indianapolis. We have a photo of the USS Indianapolis here. It was a heavy cruiser. Anyone familiar with the USS Indianapolis? Show of hands, if anyone's familiar with the USS Indianapolis, a few hands. My dad has his hand up. My folks are here. Glad to have you here, mom and dad. My dad is a huge uh, history buff, huge military buff. So uh, any, any of the, some of those nerdy pastimes that I have, I come by them honestly. Thank you, dad, for, for that great gift. But honored to have you here, mom and dad. The USS Indianapolis was a heavy cruiser. And in the early hours of the morning of the 31st of July, 1945, during the Second World War in the Pacific, two Japanese torpedoes split the ship to the keel. Minutes later, mere moments, I think it was 12 minutes later, the unescorted cruiser slipped beneath the surface of the Philippine Sea. Of the nearly 1,200 men on board, approximately 900 men made it off the sinking ship and into the shark-infested water. Few life rafts were released, partially because of communication controls during time of war and partially because of the speed with which the Indianapolis sunk, sister ships were not made immediately aware of her distress. Nearby ships only discovered the accident four days later, and only 360, uh, 316 men were still alive. So think about that. The ship went down in 12 minutes, and for four days, the survivors were bobbing in the Philippine Sea. Second only to the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis was the deadliest U.S. Navy disaster of World War II. The nights and days in the sea without food or water were horrifying. Sharks lurked and took dozens of men. Sunburn, salt water, and dehydration peeled away the men's skin. Men became delirious. Some drank seawater. They didn't have bottled water with them. This triggered greater agonizing uh, dehydration before the survivors fell into a coma and died. Many suffered from hypothermia. Others had paranoid halluc hallucinations. Some drowned when their life jackets became waterlogged and failed. Some simply let go and slipped beneath the waves. And through it all, this man, Reverend Conway, kept offering comfort and encouragement to the living and ministered to the dying. He swam around among the survivors. He ministered to the dying, and he kept the dog tags of those who passed away under his ministry, which was over a hundred, over a hundred men that he led to the Lord in their dying moments. For three nights, Reverend Conway swam to the aid of his shipmates, reassuring the increasingly dehydrated and delirious men with the gospel and with prayers until he himself drowned. Survivors of the disaster wrote of Reverend Conway that he was in every way a messenger of our Lord. Witness, uh, survivors said, I saw him go from one small group in the water to another, getting the shipmates to join in prayer and asking them not to give up hope of being rescued. He kept working until he was exhausted. He was successful in his mission to provide spiritual strength to us all. He made us believe that we would be rescued. He gave us hope and the will to endure. He will be remembered by all the survivors of his work while on board the, Indian, the Indianapolis and the three days left in the ocean. Another survivor wrote this, we have not lost everything. To the contrary, we have found one comfort, a strong belief to which we cling. God seems very close. Much of our feeling is strengthened by the chaplain who moves from one group to another to pray with the men. His courage and goodness seem to have no limit. I use this example because Reverend Conway gave his life while ministering to the men. He didn't even live to see those hundreds of men get rescued. But at least a hundred men, if not more, at least a hundred dying men came to Christ. And hundreds others who survived went on to share his testimony. And as I reflected on Conway's testimony, I couldn't help but continue to think about how here was a man whose life was very obviously over. The ship was sunk. They were bobbing around in the Philippine Sea, tiger sharks swarming around them. 
But rather than giving into despair, into despair, knowing that his life was over, he allowed himself to be used by Christ right up until his final dying moments. Church, in your brave witness, God might not be calling you to such heights of heroism, but he's called you to reach those who are lost, who are perishing, dying, and without hope. We have to look outside of ourselves. And so often we come to church, we come here and we are looking for encouragement. And that's okay. We come here looking for something that will lift us out of our own spiritual weariness. And I understand at church that sometimes the burdens of life are heavy. But sometimes we come in here and our spiritual body language is walking in with our shoulders slumped over and just looking to have our own spiritual weariness lifted. Church, I want to challenge you today to be brave in your witness. And rather than coming to church as a, a place just to have your own spiritual weariness lifted, to come to church as a place where you can get charged up to go out to reach a world that's lost, that needs your brave witness, to bring them encouragement. Think of all those who are lost and perishing that do not have the hope of Jesus. How can we not have the bravery to reach them? I'm going to close with this final point. Brave witness is effective. Verses 42 to 44 read this. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on forward as we wrap up this morning. Under the cruelty of the ancient Roman imperial regime, if a prisoner were to escape, the life of his guard would be taken in his place. Think about that. A prison guard would be executed if the prisoner that they were guarding had escaped. The soldiers did not want to risk any prisoners escaping. Now think about this. At the beginning of this episode, the ship's commanders wouldn't even listen to Paul's suggestion to remain at Fair Haven's Harbor. What does he know? He's just, he's just some spiritual leader. He said, guys, I don't know. I don't know if this is a great idea. I don't think we should leave this harbor. Now, of course, we know that Paul had been on many missionary journeys. He had been seasoned as a traveler. He had the Holy Spirit who was with him. The centurion, the deckhands, they didn't know that. They dismissed him. You know what? We're going to keep sailing. They totally dismissed what he had to say. Now, at the end of this episode, having seen Paul's resolve, having seen the fact that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul kept his witness. He kept his composure. He didn't panic. Throughout, he gave testimony to Jesus Christ. Look at the transformation here. Having seen Paul's resolve and having been moved by his brave witness, the same guards who had dismissed what Paul had to say earlier were now prepared to risk their lives in order to spare Paul's life. Don't execute the prisoners. Let's save this one. Let's save these prisoners. Church, this is effective witness. Brave witness is effective. People will see your conduct. People will see there's something different about you. I mentioned uh, I, my dad and his, his passion for history and for military lore. My dad is a great example of witness. Growing up, we would often go on family trips and we would be at a gas station or a restaurant or a rest area and we'd be there you know, having our, our lunch or filling up with gas and we'd be about to leave and we'd all get back in the car and we'd be missing one person. We'd be whis missing my dad. We couldn't go anywhere. And so as a child, you know, you're thinking, let's, let's get moving here. And I'd often see my dad somewhere off on the horizon talking to somebody. And I was probably about six, seven, eight years old at this time. And when my dad came back to the car, we'd, we'd say, Dad, where were you? What, what took you so long? What were you telling that person? What were you saying to them? My dad would say, I was just, I was just witnessing to him. I was just witnessing to that person. There were a few family trips where my dad didn't come back to the car and say, I was just witnessing to that person. Now, my dad will be the first person to tell you that the way he's able to do that is because the Holy Spirit is with him. As I said earlier, sometimes witnessing can be intimidating. Sometimes we can find that we don't have the courage just to open our mouths. But that Holy Spirit prompt is there. That moment when you get that little flutter and you think, should I say something? I encourage you, church, be brave. Open your mouth. Say something. 
the first time you say it, it might feel a little intimidating, you might feel a little shy about it. But the more you say it, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. You'll find that the Holy Spirit continues to accompany you, continues to give you that bravery. The book of Acts is all about the power of the Holy Spirit, the infilling power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is intended to give you boldness to witness, to witness boldly, to witness bravely. As we conclude in worship, I'm going to invite you to stand. As our worship team leads us in one final song of worship, I want us to think about this. Being brave in our witness, being bold in our witness, maybe it's something you've never thought about before. Maybe you're new to faith, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. And all this time you've thought that this is just something that's personal. Church, we don't have a choice in this. We don't have an option. Our Lord's instructions are to go and make disciples. You have to open your mouth. You have to be brave in your witness, but God goes with you. So as we prepare our hearts to worship, I invite you to raise your hands with me in a position of prayer before the Lord. And let's cry out to the Holy Spirit now as we worship God today. Lord Jesus, you are with us. Holy Spirit, you are with us. God, give us the bravery. Give us the boldness. We invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts to fill us, to give us boldness in witness. Lord, to reach a world that is lost and without you. God, as we worship you here in the final moments of this gathering, may we be charged up that we could go out and spread your good news. Witness bravely, witness boldly to those who are lost and who are perishing and who are in need of a Savior. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.